an international team of explorers, scientists and filmmakers is on a critical mission to save tigers. Revered and feared, the majestic tiger has been hunted to the brink of extinction. But the mysterious Himalayan kingdom of Bhutan may hold new hope. What we find out here could be essential for the survival of the species. The expedition has found tigers in the tropical south. Now, the search continues into the mountains where science says tigers shouldn't exist. We have to look everywhere. We have to search everything. That's our mission. As the team take on the mighty Himalayas, they will face their toughest challenges yet. Predators enter camp. We've got a cat. Jeez, oh, we've got a cat. God! Food supplies are ruined. I've suddenly become a vegetarian. And they are stalked by big cats. And I don't know where the hell I am. What they discover in the mountains could change the fate of tigers forever. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Bhutan is a little-known Himalayan country. From its border with India, the land rises 7,000 meters into the highest mountain range on Earth. For three weeks, the expedition has been based in the tropical south. Now they're packing up jungle base camp. The final and most crucial phase of the expedition has begun. A small team is traveling into the high Himalayas to investigate rumors that tigers are living at extreme altitudes. Gordon Buchanan is a wildlife cameraman with 10 years experience filming big cats. He's returning to these mountains to check the camera traps he set at the start of the expedition. All ready to go. Good luck. It's quite exciting because all this time that I've been at base camp, the camera traps that I laid up in the Himalayas a good while back, they've been clicking away and recording images up there. With Gordon is Oxford University biologist, Dr. George McGavin. He will be carrying out a health check of the forest to see if it's rich enough to support big cats. The cooler, higher altitude will have a completely different fauna. Totally uncharted, unknown, of its animals and plants. These mountains are the missing piece of a puzzle that might save tigers from extinction in the wild. Tigers used to range across all of Asia. Only small pockets remain. But there is a master plan to link isolated tiger populations in the last wild landscape along the foothills of the Himalayas. No one knows how many tigers there are in Bhutan. The vast tiger corridor will only be effective if evidence of tigers can be found, not just in its southern jungles, but in the mountains too. Time is not on their side. Tigers could go extinct over the next one or two decades. Literally, tigers are dying as we speak. The inspiration behind this master plan to save tigers is big cat expert, Dr. Alan Rabinovitz. The Himalayan corridor, by its nature, by its name, is a very mountainous region. Its, its survival will depend on whether or not tigers can live and move through some of these high mountain ranges. The team has just two weeks to find that vital evidence. Gordon and George's new base camp is three kilometers higher than the last one. With the help of local herders, 
This expedition will be the first from the outside world to explore this remote region. There are no roads here, so the expedition's kit is arriving by pony train. Gordon's prepared for anything. He's brought an arsenal of high-tech cameras. If we're going to be successful up here, we have to throw everything we've got at it. So we've got the thermal camera, we've got the infrared camera, we've got the big long lens and all of the camera traps. Because for Alan's idea of the tiger corridor to work, we not only have to find tigers down in the south, but we have to find tigers throughout Bhutan. Explorer Steve Backshaw is the third and final member of the mountain team. He's five days' walk to the northeast of Gordon and George's mountain camp. Steve's trekking up to the Tibetan border to a remote peak where tigers are rumored to roam. Local people call it Gang Chen Ta, Tiger Mountain. As far as knowledge of tigers go, this part of the Himalaya hasn't been explored by anybody. So any information we can find up here is going to be massively valuable. Steve has tracked deadly predators across every continent. Now he's on the trail of tigers. His field skills will help him discover whether legends of tigers living at high altitude in the Himalayas are true. Fact and fiction can become blurred at these extreme altitudes. Just saw quite a large shape moving into these trees. I'm not 100% sure what it is, so I'm going to just move quite quietly. Bhutan's mysterious mountains are supposed to be home to a huge hairy creature called the Yeti. Ah, oh, it's a yak. There are some wild yak left in the Himalaya. There are not many, most of them are domesticated and just allowed to roam free and graze like this one here. Yak usually occur too high to be tiger prey. I mean, I've never heard of it happening, but it could. A male tiger needs to eat close to Steve's body weight in fresh meat every week. The best way to track down an elusive tiger is to first find its prey. On this main track that we've been walking on, all of the tracks that are left behind are from the shod hooves of horses and donkeys. This here, this kind of chute running down the hillside is very, very steep and it's not made by domestic animals. This is definitely coming from wild animals. So there you can see a very definite cloven hoof, slightly splayed because it's going uphill on a, on a soft surface, but that is from a sambar deer. It's the largest deer found around here and the favorite prey of the tiger. So even though we haven't actually seen any of these animals yet, they're definitely here. And it's really, really good news for us because this is exactly the kind of large prey that tigers need. I mean, they'd need to eat something the size of a sambar deer probably at least once a week. Before it gets dark, Gordon and George head off to get a feel for the forest around camp. The altitude will make exploring here a physical challenge. We've just moved from the tropical forests at low altitude up to 10,000 feet in an hour, and you feel a bit breathless. So I'm not gonna be racing about after insects for for a day or two, well, one day. George will perform a rapid health check of this forest by surveying the smaller animals that live here. It's early spring, so it should be full of life. Absolutely stunning. A woodpecker. I reckon it will be very hard to see anything in this. I reckon we'll have to have a lot of luck on our side. Because even if you're very careful, you make just too much noise. 
Gordon's exploring the perimeter of camp. Just off the track. A huge scat. This is probably the kind of upper end of a leopard scat, kind of lower end of a tiger scat. It could be either, but it is definitely from a big cat. And we are, camp is just on the other side of the trees there, 200 yards away. Wow. You know, I always think where a cat walks once, it's likely to walk again. Amazing, it was just arrived and we're finding signs of big cats right beside camp. There's no way of telling if they're the droppings of a tiger or a leopard. It's a promising lead for the expedition, but signs of any big cat prowling so close is a serious worry for the herders. They round up their animals and light fires. One domestic animal like this would be an easy meal. 25 may tempt the predator even closer. That's a, a very smart idea to have them all tied up to a rope here where they can have an eye on them than having them all around the edge here because that's, that's a risk. And they are now very concerned about the, the thought that they might lose one of their animals. Big cats usually avoid humans. But hungry tigers and leopards will eat people. They ambush their prey, ideally in the pitch dark. Everyone must be on their guard. If a big cat does prowl close to camp, Gordon should spot it, using night vision or thermal imaging gear, which picks up body heat. After five cold hours, George sees something unfamiliar in the darkness. I just walked out and I saw eye shine of some animal over here, but it was moving in an odd way. It was sort of as if it was flying, but not. It is 100% a cat. It's a it had a long tail. The thermal camera picks up the ponies and a small hot spot in the trees behind them. Gordon suspects it's a leopard, but he needs confirmation. Right, do you know what I'm going to do? And I think I have to do this alone. Is try and go up and intercept the leopard. Um, he's not going to come down, I'm not going to put him off, but if I can go up and go ahead of him, I might get some shots of him on this camera. George will stay in camp with the thermal camera and warn Gordon if the leopard appears. He looks very alone there, a little white figure. It's behind you. <gasps> That's the dog there. Dogs have seen something or heard something. It's going to take more than a little dog like that to put a leopard off. One of the favourite things that leopards like to eat are, are dogs. I wonder. I wonder, I wonder. You know, I'm convinced that that leopard is still there. Gordon, there, there seems to be a very, very faint white spot just up from you to your, to your left. Towards me or away from me? If you spin round, there's a very, very tiny white spot just up the hill a bit. Over. OK, Gordon, the thing that I was, like, I could see, which is the white spot, ran or moved very quickly to the right and then back again to the left. And I think it was a smaller animal on a tree branch. Really. OK, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull out of here. I shall see you in a little minute. If it was a leopard Gordon saw, it seems to have moved off. But he's barely back in camp when the herder's dogs pick up something the team's high-tech cameras have not. The ponies sense it too. Some have broken their tethers and have strayed close to the tree line. <laughs> 